Welcome to another episode of the Textual Confidence Collective. We're coming to you not live from San Antonio, Texas. We've just gotten done finishing a fascinating discussion that Tim led with Peter Gurry, Abhinav Shah, and Maurice Robinson about Westcott and Hort and the prominence and use of their theories today in New Testament textual criticism. And the original Textual Confidence Collective, the four of us, Peter Montoro, Mark Ward, yours truly, Tim Berg, and Elijah Hickson, have finally gotten back together. Yes. After, boy, has it been a year and a half? Been a year and a half. Almost two. Oh, my goodness. And we want to take up something that I've seen a need for, and Tim especially also has seen a need for, constant slanders of Westcott and Court, of their character, of their beliefs. And I think it's been especially on Tim's heart to point out how slander is a sin. Yeah. So we want to establish some truths here uh, for ongoing debate. After kind of dealing with some of the more academic elements of the use of their theories, we want to talk about the men, Westcott and Hort. You might know the Textual Confidence Collective from our earlier videos. We push for confidence in the text of Scripture rather than textual absolutism on the one hand, or textual skepticism on the other. And Maurice and Abaddon, who were in the previous session, they do not quite hold the same view of New Testament textual criticism that the four of us hold. But we had a fascinating and collegial discussion because we stand with them for textual confidence against textual absolutism. And of course, we stand with Westcott and Court on those matters as well. We want to open a prayer, actually, and since we're going to examine the lives and work of several Anglican scholars, none of us are Anglican, uh, we're all low church boys, but we want to uh, pull out a collect, we confirmed the pronunciation of this word just before the session, just in case, that Westcott, B.F. Westcott, Brooke Foss Westcott, wrote for his own family devotions. And I wonder if, Tim, you could... Yeah. Absolutely. And I will just pray. I'm happy and fine to pray in written prayer. So as we go before the Lord, that can be helpful and has been done for many, many, many centuries in the Christian church. Blessed Lord, by whose providence all holy scriptures were written and preserved for our instruction, give us grace to study them each day with patience and love. Strengthen our souls with the fullness of their divine teaching. Keep from us all pride and irreverence. Guide us in the deep things of thy heavenly wisdom and of thy great mercy. Lead us by thy word into everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. So let me introduce the topic this way. We've done some prep here and we've got a plan. We want to talk through. Everyone's going to get a chance to talk. But actually, my introduction to King James onlyism, my most formal introduction taught by my otherwise excellent pastor, for whom I'm grateful back in my high school years, there was really one thing that stuck out to me that I remembered over the years, and that was that Westcott and Hort were very bad dudes, and anything that they touched was bad. That message came through to me as a 14 or 15-year-old. I can't remember how old I was when this sermon series on why we use the King James was preached at my church. My church did not harp on the King James all the time, but I definitely got a, a strong dose of Westcott and Hort are bad. And it seems, and I'm, I'm really basing this on what you've written, Tim, but it seems that the argument for King James only is when it comes to Westcott and Hort often starts with an unstated premise that any heretical hands that have touched a biblical text taint it beyond redemption. It's like sticking, I've heard this analogy a thousand times, you have too, a million times. I'd rather have pure water than, you know, water with much dirt in it or water with even a tiny bit of drop of poison in it. And the reasoning continues you know, with another premise that actually you were undermining in the previous session, Tin, that all modern translations are basically based on the Westcott work text and that modern New Testament textual criticism has really not moved on beyond their viewpoint. Uh, then, I've heard this many, many times, Westcott and Horde were occultic apostates who denied the deity and resurrection of Jesus, the inspiration and fallibility of scripture, and did not vote for your preferred political party in Elm. And anything bad you can attach to West Cotton Court is kind of fair game with mm. these guys. Uh, therefore, all modern translations are to be rejected. And I get this in my comments all of the time yeah. on this channel. Yeah. So I think it's really appropriate to test these premises in this session. And of course, we've already done some of that in the previous session. Right. 
So in this session, we want to ask, what about these various specific accusations against against West Cotton work? Are they actually true? Let me just hand it right over to you, Peter. Talk to us about the sin of slander. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's also the start, you know, what is actually at stake with this. The Bible has a lot to say about our speech. Right. And so, you know, before we start talking about the specifics of West Cotton Porter, textual criticism, we should start with the foundation, and we'll use the King James for this, mm. of what does the King James, what does the Bible, in any translation, what are some of the guidelines it gives us for what forms of speech are appropriate? And of course, we're warned against any form of sp- false speech, so we're not to say that which is not true. Um, so you have Exodus twenty sixteen in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And you see, even there in the Ten Commandments, you have a, a concern you know, by implication that that would address all forms of false speech, but it has a particular concern for speech that causes reputational harm right, right. Um, to other humans. So there's a particular concern for that. And that comes out also in Exodus 23, 1, thou shalt not raise, which it raise it, it's, it's literally lift up a false report, put God thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. You look at this in its context, um, in the meaning of raising a false report, is of lifting up it. If it's someone else has put out this false report and you're picking it up and you're carrying it on. Mm. So the idea is you're spreading. So that's that's what's being, um, so that we use the English words a little differently today, but the idea here in both Hebrew and, and, and you know what the King James translators would have intended uh, is that you're spreading a false report. So it's not just that you're not to start one, but if a false report is going around and you see that in the second half of the verse, you're not to put your hand with those who are spreading a false report. That's not okay. You don't do that. Um, and this is a New Testament principle as well. Ephesians 4.25, Wherefore, putting away lies, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And again, there's this idea of a particular concern within a covenant community. Now, it's not like we can just tell lies outside the covenant community. That's not <laughs> that important. <laughs> um, but there is a concern for our fellow believers, our fellow covenant members, that we are to have a, a particular extra special burden of of guarding the reputations and speaking truth to them. Right. Um, we, like you get, I want to be clear, we should speak truth to everyone, but there's a particular concern that that gets addressed in these and other verses more often than any other form of false speech. Um, and Revelation 21.8 makes it very clear what the stakes are, um, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and foremongers and sorcerers and idolaters it's a bad list. You don't want to be on that list. And all liars shall have their part in the lake and burn it with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so, you know, scripture takes false speech very seriously. And it takes false speech seriously, whether it originated with us or not. So that's the first thing. There's a second form of speech we're commanded not to engage in that we've already guessed, and that's abusive speech. Mm-hmm. Um, and so first Corinthians six nine, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, be the fornicators, or idolaters, or adulterers, or effeminate, or abusers of themselves of mankind, speaking of homosexuality and both of those primarily, nor thieves, covetousness, nor drug rates. Again, this is a bad list of things that we would recognize. These are all bad things. And um, nor extortioner, I skipped over one, shall inherit the kingdom of God. The one I skipped over is this, revilers. A loiteros, that's the Greek word, is someone who uses speech that is highly insulting, abusive, reproach, reproach or reviling. So someone who is a loiteros isn't necessarily saying things that are false, though often when you're engaging in this kind of abusive and insulting speech, you'll engage in falsehood as well. But technically, you could be a reviler, even if everything you say is true. But it has to do with someone who has, it, 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 it not just that you speak strongly for the truth, but that you're just seeking to tear someone down and you don't care what means you use to do it. So just throw everything out there as abusive and destructive as you can be with your speech. That's your dialect. Mm-hmm. Um, another word is blasphemia, the, the idea of blaspheming, and it gets translated in Titus 3 as this. So Titus 3, 1, put them in mind. This is how, what Titus is supposed to instruct the church. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, um, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Speech that is denigrates or defames, reviling, denigration, disrespect, slander. And these are just two of the words. There's actually other words we could go to uh, if we wanted to take more time. But this idea that speech that denigrates the characters of others, what are one, it should be true. Number two, there's a sense that it needs to be necessary and should be no more 
defamatory that is necessary for the defense of the truth. Right. So just attacking someone's reputation because you can or because it lifts you up is something that scripture takes very seriously. There's a third form of speech that Jesus himself warns us against. Matthew 12, 36, But I say unto you that every idle word of men shall speak. They shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. So the word translated as idle, it's the same word that refers to those who are idle in the marketplace. It's literally, this is lazy speech. This is the speech of those who are not being diligent, not willing to work, not employed in, in, in safeguarding what they're coming, coming out of their mouth. And so if we're to sum this up, we are commanded to avoid false speech of all kinds. We're not to originate falsehoods. We're not to spread them. Even if the truth at our side, we're not to engage in abusive speech just because we think we're right. Um, and we're warned we'll be judged for lazy speech. So it seems to me that the point of all of this is that we should never share memes on Facebook because they just, you know, chef all of these almost all the time. Mm -hmm. That was a, not entirely a joke, <laughs> yeah. but not to, it, But the point is that God takes falsehoods Right. Very seriously. Yeah. And he's especially concerned when our falsehoods cause, cause reputational damage, d yeah. damage to our neighbors and reputational damage to our neighbors who are fellow believers in particular. So making false accusations against fellow believers is, in God's eyes, one of the sins he takes most seriously. That's right. He didn't mm -hmm. sit in the same list with homosexuality. Yeah. That they don't keep you out of it. Yeah. It is that serious. It doesn't get any more serious than this. Right. It can absolutely destroy a church, destroy a person in the church. Yeah. Ministerially, I've seen it happen. Um, I've seen the damage that, that can that can come from that. Yeah. Well, and I, I might chime in to say one of the things we don't, maybe normally in the TCC talk about the really right-wing extreme crazies, and we've tried to, for the most part, I think, shoot at more moderate targets and, and intelligent, helpful targets. Yeah, yeah. And we, in fact, we normally speak more broadly of textual absolutism, whereas here we're really kind of specifically addressing that subgroup of King James onlyism. But one of the reasons we do so in sessions like this, and we think it's important is specifically at this issue of slander, is we have a pastoral concern for, for people's souls. God's placed a charge upon us to watch for their souls, and, and you guys each serve, you know, in, in heavy pastoral ministry. And slander, I, I might disagree with my brother about a textual position. I might disagree with many, many of my good friends about the King James Bible and some who are textual absolutists, if they wouldn't claim that title, what I would call them. But when it comes to this issue, it's not a matter of just I agree or you disagree about the, the text of Scripture. It's you're engaging in sin. Right. You are sinning against God, and Christians cannot continue in impenitent sin. They must confess and repent. So we care about your soul. And we want to talk about yeah, exactly. And I think this is particularly, you know, significant for pastors, because if you're a pastor, people will engage in the sin of slander against you. Sure, everyone who's listening to us, what, whatever your textual position, if you've been engaged in serious pastoral ministry, you have felt abusive, slanderous, false speech towards yourself. It comes with the territory, and so for you to then turn around this thing that has been one of the heaviest burdens you've had to bear, and to just throw that out there towards mm -hmm. others. And that's, you know, that's going to hinder your prayers. Yeah. And that's going to hinder your ability to even bring your burdens to the Lord if you're doing the same thing to others. That's, that's really dangerous territory to be in. And that's my concern. Um, and that really, you know, in my old story, one of the things that turned me from the King James only as I was raised in, even at a relatively young age that raised serious, you know, questions, um, is so many of the voices I was being pointed towards were just didn't care about slander. And it was obvious to me the Bible did. Yeah. And in, in the King James, that I was reading the Grand James every day, <laughs> and that the Bible cared about the actual truthfulness of the speech. And if we were to be the only ones who had the truth and everyone else was wrong, and, but we actually didn't care that our speech was truthful, that, and, and again, I don't want to say that everyone was King James only doesn't care. Right, right, um, sure. But there was that there. I want to be very clear. I don't. I don't want to engage in the sin of slander myself. Right. Like, right. Exactly. But there were many who did, um, and there were many who were the ones others were looking to, that they were trusting, that were not using their speech in a trustworthy way. Yeah. You know. So I'd want to say, you know, someone like Gail Ripplinger, who knows better, yeah, has been called out and has publicly said she doesn't care. Yeah. Or someone like D. A. Wadey, who purports to know better. And I don't know, but he proclaims and says that he has the competence to make these judgments. Yeah. But then he says things that are not true. Yeah. Um, that he ought to know are you know that he ought to know are not true. Yeah. Blatantly and, false. 
Yeah. And there are many others that could. Say ignorance only goes so far. Like, you, you know, I'd say ignorance that has bad connotations, but there's nothing morally wrong with not knowing. Uh -huh. We have to trust people. Yeah, yeah. It's just how life functions. I have a doctor's appointment when we get done and I go back. I have to trust my doctor. I'm not an expert at that. But at the same time, um, I'm not having a platform giving other people medical advice. Right. 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 And at some point, uh, trusting the wrong people who are doing these things becomes an issue of taking that uh, on a, upon ourselves. Yeah. Well, and especially as Peter mentioned, raising that report, not just that I'm mistrusting someone who uh, has knowledge that I don't in ignorance, but out of that ignorance to then attack someone's reputation is just a whole separate morally culpable issue. Let's not forget that the very name Satan means accuser or slanderer. But we have to talk through a little bit more of the Bible's teaching on this. Let's let's actually, by, to take a step toward West Cotton Ward, Let's talk about that other premise. Do heretical hands taint a Bible text? Yeah, and I, I think what we want to really be careful on is we want to say, if we say, you know, like we're not accepting this accusation, that's going to be, you know, dealt with in a later video. But if we say that heretical hands or, you know, even even reprobate hands of any kind really is what the accusation is, that if you, if you have unholy hands, for whatever reason they're unholy, whether false teaching, false living, if we want to say unholy hands contaminate a text, um, or even unholy associations can contaminate the text, because that's really the way that this accusation is deployed, yeah. then we have to apply that consistently. Right. And we have to do so for a biblical reason. Deuteronomy 25, uh, verse 13 and following, thou shalt not have in thy, thy bag divers, that is different weights, a great and a small. Thou shalt not have in thy house divers measures, a great and small. But thou shalt have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. So this idea that you have one measure for us and another measure for our enemies. Again, this is the same word of abomination that is used for homosexuality and the other most extreme um, things that God hates. And he hates it when we have a double standard. And so... We better not have a double standard. Whatever standard uh, we have needs to be done consistently. And I want to say the concern to avoid compromise with evil that motivates many King James only defenders is commendable. Yeah. Because there are these scripture verses like Galatians 5, 9, a little leaven, leaven at the whole love book, come out from among, uh, don't have this one in my notes, but you know, come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing. These verses are in the Bible and they yeah. do mean something and we have to apply them, but we have to be careful that however we apply them, we can apply them consistently right. and to our own proud and not just the right we are distrustful of. And we want to be careful that we don't contradict other scripture because scripture is consistent. And that's the first slide that in, in applying these principles of like a little leaven, leaven at the whole love, that's Galatians 5.9, um, there, there are two aspects that we need to give attention to so that we don't end up with a double standard. One is that God can use anyone to accomplish his purposes, including very flawed individuals in both belief and in practice. So you have Samson, who was clearly flawed. He was an, not, on, not on God's agenda. Um, and yet, he's clearly empowered by the Spirit. He's used by God. His faith is referenced in Hebrews 11. And I would argue, um, this would, to give all the details would get beyond this, but um, that uh, when Matthew talks about Jesus being a Nazarene, uh, one of the things he's picking up on is a connection back to the Nazarite vow and Samson. And Samson dies with his arms outstretched in the middle of his enemies for his people. He's the only person in the Old Testament who does that. And it's an intentional connection to Christ. Samson with all his flaws, just like Jonah with all his flaws as a rebel prophet. These are used to point to Jesus. So God uses who he wants to, how he wants to, we could go even more extreme than a flawed judge or a flawed, pro flawed prophet. Isaiah 10, Assyria is described as the rod of God's anger. This is God's instrument of judgment. And it says, you don't think that's what you're doing. You have a totally different idea of what you're doing. You have your own agenda, but I'm actually using you. Um, and this is my instrument to accomplish my purposes. And of course, you have Cyrus, who's God's servant. And the New Testament, I think one of the most significant and relevant examples, Philippians 1.15 and following, 
Some indeed preach Christ, even if envy and strife, and some also have goodwill. The one preached Christ out of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my thoughts. So there are these people that are preaching Christ in order to make the Apostle Paul feel more miserable. That is not a good motive, right? <laughs> these are not good people that are doing this. Right. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel, that's a good motive. But then, notwithstanding every way, notwithstanding every way, whether of pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I there do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So Paul is able to rejoice in the preaching of those who are preaching in pretense to make his suffering more tense. And so that means then that this principle of not touching the unclean thing, a little leaven, leavening the whole lump, can't apply to who God can use to accomplish his purposes, that the work itself is contaminated. Because if it, if it was, that would contradict all of these and many other, we could go for hours of all of these examples. And, and, and the reason I picked these particular examples is there's no evidence that any of these people really repented, mm-hmm. you know? So you could say, well, God is, you know, Paul the apostle, the persecutor. Well, Paul clearly repented. These groups and individuals, no evidence that they did. And yet there is evidence that God used them in a work that was not contaminated by their unholiness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so here then is where the rubber meets the road. And this is, this is really the pastoral concern here. Because if we apply this standard consistently to the text, if we say unholy hands at any point um, mean, make the text defiled and unusable, it leaves us with no text at all. Right? Yeah, that's, right. that's where this comes down to. Yeah. Because if we, can, um, if we can't have a double standard, in Deuteronomy 25, this is very clear we can't, um, then Erasmus was in communion with the papacy to the day of his death. That's right. First edition of the TR, it's dedicated to Leo X, you know, the very Pope whose extravagant abuses provoked the Reformation. All the indulgences Luther was protesting against. The papal bull against Luther. Yes. <laughs> right. This is, and and while, you know, Erasmus certainly critiques some of the abuses, he never separated from them right. uh, because he didn't want to be cut off from his sources of funding. Yeah. I mean, he was very, op- like, this wasn't ambiguous why he was doing right. this. Yeah. Um, and then you could speak to this, some of the Byzantine manuscripts we have, you have that thing. So, yeah, um, I mean, we have colophons that tell us about who wrote some of these manuscripts. Not always. Sometimes they didn't write one, sometimes they don't survive. But, you know, when I look at a manuscript and I see a scribe thanking Mary for giving them the grace to finish this book of the Gospels, I think that's probably not somebody who would be invited to preach. Like <laughs> right. Yeah. But that's who gave us the manuscripts uh that that we that we have today. The yeah. Byzantine, Byzantine manuscripts. manuscripts. Yeah. Yeah. I just, you know, I want to share share an anecdote. This is something that I'm I'm not gonna give the names, but you know, a, a, a group of churches that I was familiar with growing up. Um so there was a man who started a church out of another church. Um and it was sort of, it wasn't, this is not mainstream for the heart of the movement. You know, I talked about some of my background, but he was welcome in those circles. Um, and so he started his church and then he fell out of ministry. He committed a serious sin. Um, and I found out afterwards that there was this belief in the church, this and out, that bad seed can't produce good fruit. So it's basically applying this to ministry. And so they concluded that no one who had been gathered at that church had truly been converted or baptized. Oh, wow. And so all of them needed to be converted and baptized again. And I spoke with this. This wasn't like third-hand information. I spoke with the person that they had as the new pastor of the church um, that we were supporting, that our church was supporting him financially. So this was, you know, this is what he told me directly. Um, and so, no, obviously, that seed can't produce good fruit. And so this idea that unruly hands contaminate the work you take that to its logical conclusion, you try to apply it consistently. Now, here's where the story gets weirder, because the person who was the one who came up with that idea, who set him out, is now no longer in the ministry or following Jesus. So now, how far back do you want to trace that? You know, and I don't, I don't know the end of that. I've, I've been out of the loop, but I just know, you know, that he is in serious legal trouble and like really, really messy situation. Um, and so you get this kind of idea you get to a place where you have nothing at all and you're basically tempting God with despair. Yeah. And and I, I just think that's something that we ought not do. 
And of course, you'd want to say, I think a lot of people would want to say, well, you have this context of Erasmus and, and, the, and the Byzantine monks and all of these things. There's, there's all of these extenuating factors that make them different from West Cotton Court, for example. And these are just bad dudes. But I think, again, if we're going to have a single standard, we've got to talk about the context of, you know, 19th century Anglicanism. And that's where Tim's going to take us, uh, take us on. Yeah. So we need to, if we're going to rightly assess them the way we would want to be rightly assessed, we need to kind of understand the era that they wrote in. And it's admittedly difficult for us as part of the free church tradition to get our minds around what Anglican theology and controversy looked like, especially back in the Victorian era. We might think, well, the, Vic the Victorian era is not so long ago. There's even, you know, early forms of what we might call a, a photograph that we can look back at. That's just, just a few years ago, right? So it's really close to us. We understand it. But actually the opposite is uh, the case. Um, Colin Matthew, a major Victorian historian, made this point really well. He said, the 19th century is often assumed to be easy to understand because it's chronologically close. But that period is now far distance from us. And the 19th century, in terms of its mindset, is in fact one of the centuries most alien to the modern mind. So it, it actually takes a lot of historical work, even though we're not going as far back in time as maybe the Reformation or the early church. There's such a different shape to the theological controversies and to the shape of the Victorian church that we just have to kind of step back for a minute and try to read that broader history. So let me try to do that for us real quick. First, uh, of course, we're talking about Anglicans, right? Westcott and Hort and Scrivener and Bergen. These are all people serving in the Anglican church. So what is Anglicanism? Uh, well, Anglican, Anglicanism and the Church of England come about as a product of the English Reformation in the 1530s. Uh, we're familiar, of course, with Luther nailing the 95 Thesis, or probably, I think, mailing some the thesis to be nailed. But somebody nailed the 95 Thesis, and in Germany and on the continent, the Reformation sweeps across Europe as a primarily theological movement about the authority structures of the church and the Bible and about uh, uh, the means of forgiveness and justification. Huge theological issues. Well, when the Reformation comes to England, it comes via King Henry VIII, wanting to get a divorce or annulment from his wife, Catherine. And this Reformation thing is taking place over there, and he really likes Catholic theology. He doesn't believe in justification by faith. He's written uh, strongly and ferociously against Luther and been named the defender of the faith. By the Pope. Yeah, but he says, well, now the Pope won't give me a divorce, so I guess I'll switch sides, but I don't really like their theology. So he becomes essentially a, a pope over the church in England and says, actually, they were right about some things, but instead of the pope being in charge, the king is. So I'm in charge. And you get a church that, uh, it takes several decades for this to develop, but eventually what happens by the 1620s, you get a church that is essentially Protestant in its theology, but Catholic in all of its liturgy. It still has priests, it still has bishops. It's the only Protestant church that still has episcopacy and a bishopric system. Um, at that time at least, and it has this written liturgy. We read, you know, a prayer earlier. That's what church service looks like for them. Morning prayer, evening prayer, very closely scripted worship. So it's a Protestant church, but it's really hard for us outside of that tradition to get our minds around it. Um, in terms of the, the way that the Anglican church kind of divided theologically, there were basically three parties. Not everyone was a part of any of these parties, but three parties sort of developed in the Victorian era, uh, what we call the high churchmen. And there have been high church strands all the way from the time back to Lancelot Andrews, right? This idea that uh, the church fathers would be really highly respected, specifically that bishops are the successors of the apostles and bear apostolic authority. So church authority in the episcopate has this massive function that's been around for a long time and it's still present in Victorian England. But then what also develops as a result of the revivals is kind of a low church party that disagrees with some of those ideas, disagrees especially with some of the high view of baptism because now we've got people preaching that you need to be born again. Wait a minute, I thought I was baptized as an infant. All, Angl all Anglicans baptize as an infant, right? But now I believe I have to be born again as an adult, so where is regeneration located? So you get kind of a strand of the Victorian church that has a lower view. Yes, Peter. I want to throw in just going back to, to, where, to Henry's Reformation that you have a certain degree of top-down Reformation. Mm -hmm. And he's very influential. Mm -hmm. And he, he does... Henry sees himself, there's been a recent historical work done on Henry's Reformation, that he sees himself as reforming the church. Mm -hmm. So he's not just trying to, to carry on the medieval. So you've got his desire for divorce, but he also, Henry really thinks of himself as a theologian mm -hmm. and as a reforming theologian. Yeah. But then you have the bottom up work from the beginning of people like Tyndale That's right. um, and others who were really preaching so that the low church isn't just something that comes in later, but people who are genuinely evangelical in theology are there from the beginning. And then you have those who are unhappy with um, Henry, but also unhappy with being dead. 
Uh, and so you have that continuing Catholicism. Yeah. yeah. And then Cranmer, you know, that middle rate. So you have these things coming in, not just developing later. And then, not yeah, Jose, but, no, I agree. you know, you have this, this uh, streams coming in, in a way that you really have a plurality of actual reformations mm-hmm. in a way that's so a little distinct from, say, the Lutheran or, or uh, say, the uh, Reformed Reformation in Switzerland. Yeah. Yeah. And, and because Henry's three children went different directions right. with the throne, that it's a topsy turvy, ugly mess for how it develops because you get a thoroughly Protestant young son, but only reigns for a few years, and then a thoroughly Protestant Catholic daughter, and then a Protestant daughter who realizes, man, there's people on both sides of that top down and bottom up. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Three uh, anti Protestant. Um, and then with Elizabeth, you get what we call the Elizabethan settlement religion, where she kind of is the one that builds this church that says, okay, I'll be Protestant in all my theology, except maybe some of my ecclesiology but I'll be Catholic still in some of my liturgy. And it's kind of the middle ground that's found for the Church of England. So you've got then, as it develops in the Victorian era, that high church party, some strands of that low church party that are now developing influenced by the evangelical revival. And you also get, because of the criticism, historical and biblical criticism that's taking place in Germany, as that comes into England, you get a group that begins to refer to themselves as the broad church party. They're essentially what we call the liberal wing of Anglicanism. So there's these three big parties in the Anglican church at the time, high church, low church, and broad church. They're all kind of arguing with each other for Anglican identity, who really represents the face of Anglicanism. And there are people that don't really fit in any of those molds exactly. So let me just real quick run through a couple of the essential historical moments that shape that. Of course, the revivalism of the first and second great awakenings, this emphasis on personal conversion and therefore question about regeneration. Where does it happen? Is it in baptism? That's what our uh, formularies say. But now we're also claiming that someone has to personally trust in Christ and be born again, and that's regeneration. So there's difficulties there. Um, Then you have the Oxford movement that develops in the 1830s. John Keeble preaches a sermon called National Apostasy and claims that in the midst of this struggle for Anglican identity, liberalism is overtaking the church and the secular elements of the church are exercising too much control, especially in Ireland, cutting down the number of bishops. And the real answer is to find Anglican identity in patristic sources in that ceremonial ritualistic liturgy. And so they re-emphasize kind of the Roman Catholic element. That takes its biggest expression in what's known as the Tracts for the Times. I have John Henry Newman's here, or most of his, a selection of 90 uh, articles, some of them almost books, that get published over the course of the next decade, that's trying to recover that high church, almost Anglo-Catholic strand. So that takes place and it's there opposing, understand, liberalism. Firmly opposing liberalism. A lot of the people that write about Westcott and Hort don't seem to understand that the broad church and the uh, high church or tractarian element, they are not the same movement. They are utterly opposed to one another. They are debating and fighting with each other. Then, of course, you get a massive scientific revival when Darwin's Origin of the Species is published in 1859. Now people are asking for the first time really serious questions about how science and faith relate to each other. Yeah, cosmology, where does the world come from? Um, And then right in the midst of that, the broad church movement finally creates kind of a manifesto known as Essays and Reviews, publishes it in 1860. Uh, They were called at the time by many people who didn't like them, the Seven Against Christ. Because what they've done, especially Benjamin Jowett and his chapter um, on the interpretation of scripture, they've come along, accepted the criticism from Germany and said, you know what, actually, the Bible's not even an inspired book. God doesn't speak in it. It's, it's not really from God. It's just like any other book, and it should be interpreted like any other book, which is Jowett's big phrase, causes a firestorm from the high church and the low church parties, including John Bergen, uh, who we've mentioned before, who ends up preaching seven sermons to match the seven against Christ called Inspiration and Interpretation, furious that they would interpret the Bible like any other book. So all that movement's going on, and at the same time, economically and politically, you have the economic uh Uh, revolution taking place, the Industrial Revolution, and this optimism, you know, the Great Exhibition of 1851. We've really finally come to the pinnacle of human achievement. They, of course, had no idea that a world war was a few decades around the corner. But from their perspective, man, we're at the place where humanity's never been here before. We're learning more about science, more and more about health. We finally figured out that there, if you wash your hands, maybe people won't die as you're a doctor. (laughs) Like, that's this massive thing that takes place. So why not apply that to the biblical text? People have been calling for a revision of the Bible, science and uh, the study of the science of textual criticism has advanced. So, of course, there's a call that we talked about in the last session for a revision of the King James Version that is decided in 1870 and 71 and then is worked on until 1881. All of that is going on in the context in which we're going to stop and try to assess Westcott and Hort. So the question is, where do they fit in all that? Where were Westcott and Hort? Well, they both regularly stated, we don't fit in any of these three big parties. They felt those were schisms. Those were attempts within the church to cut other people off from the church. 
Uh, so they didn't directly identify with any party, but basically, I think we su could suggest that Hort was pretty close to a high churchman in his theology, and West got pretty close to a low churchman, but they each had sympathies with each of the other ring wings. And let me explain what those sympathies were. Hort was specifically sympathetic to very many broad church concerns, especially their freedom to think and speak independently. But understand, he opposed the movement's rejection of orthodoxy. He held very firmly to the creeds and opposed their rejection of creedal Christianity that affirms the Nicene Creed and all that orthodoxy there. Uh, he didn't like the Athanasian Creed, um, but he affirms the Apostles' Creed. So he opposes that, but likes their... Uh, would be things like the deity of Christ that's right, and the yeah. resurrection and these things that, uh, for those who are just familiar with the creeds. Yeah, yeah. The, the, we don't recite them, of course, in our, our circles, but they were reciting them daily. And he firmly affirms them, believes in them, holds to that orthodoxy, so disagrees with the broad church party at that point. Um, both of them also had some disagreements with the broad church party about biblical, biblical authority. Jowett's coming out and claiming the Bible's not inspired. They both intended, together with Lightfoot, to write a massive response to the essays and reviews called Faith and Reason, where they were going to argue that the opposite was the case, that the Bible was thoroughly inspired, but that scientific and historical criticism could play its role. So they're opposing some high church concerns, opposing some broad church concerns, and opposing some low church concerns. They don't fit exactly in any of those wings, but essentially were, from the, the aspects of their times, I think we could say, orthodox in their creedal theology, even if we'll see Hort had some really unusual ideas when we start to look through some of the specific slanders and accusations. Some of them are true, and Hort had some theology that we maybe wouldn't be uncomfortable with. Um, but they uh, they lead us to a place that I hope we can help helpfully understand. Let me maybe make an illustration that I think will wrap it up for us and kind of uh, place them on the map, because it's hard for us to place Anglicans on the map. I think, and this isn't a perfect analogy, but I think we could probably similarly compare uh, F.J.A. Hort to C.S. Lewis. He's an Anglican bishop, has some some strong high church sympathies, um, but has some really questionable views uh, about inerrancy. Uh, C.S. Lewis doesn't accept inerrancy. Hort was willing to kind of provisionally affirm infallibility, but didn't want to proclaim it as doctrine. Still accepts some form of inspiration. And the, again, the parallels aren't exact. Had some reformulations of the doctrine of hell. So some things were going on there that we might say, hey, that's heterodox, you know, at best but also a positive influence most people would say, and I think most of our listeners would say, from much of the church, and I think Court could be seen that way. Westcott, much more firmly orthodox in his recitation of what we would today call evangelical Christianity. He didn't like the word evangelical, but he thoroughly supported the resurrection of Jesus, the deity of Jesus, the inspiration of Scripture, the infallibility of Scripture, the preservation of Scripture, and I would be comfortable having him come and speak at our church, even though I disagree with him, and I think we could put him in a similar category as like an N.T. Wright kind of broadly evangelical, maybe doesn't like the term, doesn't want to get involved in all the debates that sometimes evangelicals like to argue about in terms of penal substitutionary atonement, um, debates about inerrancy. But broadly, I think we could respect as a scholar that we can trust to defend creedally orthodox Christianity. So I think that kind of helps us put them on the map a little bit, and we'll talk about specific issues in our next session. That next session will take place uh, either virtually or we'll figure out something and that's kind of the late here in San Antonio. And I think what's really important to end here with is that, you know, we started with a pushback, a long pushback, biblical one against slander, right? Yeah. We're trying to set up an accurate representation of Westcott's and Hort's views. But that did not stop you, Tim, who've, you know, done the most work of all of us on their views um, from mentioning things that you disagreed with. That's right. And uh, even saying, I'm not so sure I'd want this individual to be preaching in my yeah. church. So to stop short of slander does not mean to stop short of disagreement. That's right. Uh, it, it, it means to accurately report. Right. But, yeah. And that, that's what charity demands. Yeah. When you disagree with someone, when someone disagrees with me, I just want them to say what I said. Just try to represent my viewpoint in terms that I could affirm. Westcott and Hort, um, that they receive a level of slanderous accusation yeah which is uh just incredible yeah we're gonna get into unlike anything i've ever seen it, it it seems as if many defenders of the exclusive use of the king james version have pinned a ton of the weight of their viewpoint on this one set of premises that we've talked through uh and then therefore on a set of ideas about the way west cotton court were so we promise we are going to get into these details. Quite obviously, we can't stop here. We have set ourselves up for a longer discussion, but we've done the homework. Yeah. We're going to actually quote West Cotton Hort, try to canvas their views in a way that is charitable and accurate, even when, as today we do, we disagree.
Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next time on this exciting YouTube channel uh, full of all kinds of Bible nerdery <laughs> for more discussion of West Cotton Court and the slanders against them. Thank you guys for coming out. And I want to thank, I won't name the church uh, here in San Antonio for hosting us here. And uh, it's been a real delight. So thank you again. See you next time.